Hollow Knight is a fascinating game. The game features a map that is so large that it puts most other metroidvanias to shame. It features a combat system that is so tight that it has a higher skill ceiling than most modern AAA games. It features an art style that is so beautiful that much more recent games look pale in comparison. The game's world has lore equally deep as the Souls games. It has tight platforming that can compete with franchises that have done nothing but platforming for decades. Its world is filled to the brim with secrets to discover. The game features story moments so strong they can compete with some of gaming's finest moments and some systems, like the game's healing system, are so brilliantly designed that I can only wish that more games finally start to copy it. In short, Hollow Knight is an incredibly competent game on pretty much all fronts. In my opinion, it is a masterpiece and we will discuss all of those things in detail. However, those things aren't what I find most fascinating about Hollow Knight. The most fascinating aspect of the game is something entirely different, something that is seldom discussed. The most fascinating aspect of Hollow Knight is that it exists in the first place. Because to put it mildly, Hollow Knight's existence should not be possible. Here's the thing, Hollow Knight was developed by only three people in roughly three years. Three people managed to produce a game that looks this beautifully, features a combat system with a skill ceiling this high, crafted a world this big, wrote lore that deep and crafted gameplay this fluid. Those people did a job that puts most teams of 60 people that work for half a decade on a game to shame. How did the three pull this off? What wizardry is going on behind the surface of this beautiful little game that allowed such a small team to craft such an ambitious title? Why is Hollow Knight? In this video, we are hopefully going to answer this question. We'll go through the game chronologically and discuss several interesting aspects of it along the way. We'll chat about the lore and the story. We'll take a closer look at the combat system and the bosses. We'll talk about where the game drew inspiration from and why slopes are bad for you. But most importantly, we'll hopefully understand how Team Cherry was able to create a game, the scope of Hollow Knight, and why there is an even bigger lesson for the entire industry hidden within this fascinating little game. As for spoilers, due to the nature of this video, this thing is going to spoil the entire game. Like literally everything, including the final boss fight. Don't worry, that is not the final boss fight in the background yet, that's just a video of a ladybug opening its wings on the National Geographic. Alright, we got tons of things to discuss, so let's get this thing going. My name is Steve, you're watching Steve Perspective, a place that hopes to give perspective on interesting aspects of great games. This is Hollow Knight. The game begins with a creepy shot of a mysterious being being chained away at some forgotten place. Suddenly, this being awakens and cries out. The next shot shows a lone wanderer arriving close to the city. This wanderer takes a plunge towards the city and with this, the story introduction already comes to a close. We take control over the wanderer and the game starts. It's actually going to be hours and hours of gameplay before the next major story moment. Hollow Knight has a wonderful story to tell, but it certainly doesn't waste anyone's time telling it through cutscenes. Most of Hollow Knight's story is told via the world itself. In a certain way, Hollow Knight's world is its story, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. After a short tutorial area that introduces the core mechanics of the game, we arrive in Dirtmouth, the game's hub, and the city that we saw in the opening before. Dirtmouth is a small fading town inhabited by only a couple of bucks. The paths east and west of the city are sealed and we can't open them. Our only way forward is through the well in the center of the little town. Below this well, something mysterious is hidden because Dirtmouth is built upon the ruins of a much larger kingdom, a fallen kingdom. Below Dirtmouth lie the ruins of the fallen kingdom of Hollow Nest. The majority of Hollow Knight plays out in those ruins. So we hop down the well for the very first time and... 1986 Original Zelda is a game that famously starts in a very interesting and unique way. The original Legend of Zelda game is all about freedom and exploration. Miyamoto famously stated that his goal with the original Zelda was it to capture the feeling he had exploring the woods and caves around his hometown. And the original Zelda already shows this commitment to capturing a feeling of exploration and freedom from the very first second it begins. The game starts with Link in the middle of a screen that leads into three different directions and has a cave to explore. The very first screen in the original Legend of Zelda game confronts us already with a choice. We have to decide whether we want to go north, east, west 
or into the cave first. The original settler commits to this idea of exploration so much that it allows us to explore into whatever direction we want to go from the very first screen. Okay, so why are we waffling about the opening of the original settler in a video about Hollow Knight? Well, because Hollow Knight does the exact same. The moment our brave little knight jumps down this well, the tutorial ends and the real game begins. At its core, Hollow Knight is a game about exploring and slowly conquering the kingdom of Hollow Nest. And the very first thing we have to do once we enter it is to make a choice. We have to decide whether to go to the right or to the left. The same way Zelda forced players to decide where to explore first in the 80s, Hollow Knight forces us to make a choice as well. Hollow Knight doesn't send a player on a linear path. It is a game that wants players to forge their own path through its many challenges. The game commits to this idea already, the very second we jump into Hollow Nest for the first time. So which direction is the correct one? Well, funnily enough, it's neither. Both paths are pretty much mandatory. The path to the left introduces critical gameplay systems like the map, the grub father, and later leads to green path. While the path to the right is the one that leads to the false knight and to a first ability, vengeful spirit, that we need to progress. But we obviously don't know that our first time through. And so Hollow Knight's core gameplay begins. The first half of Hollow Knight is all about slowly conquering a dangerous and confusing kingdom. Step by step, we hop down the well, explore a couple of rooms and probably die. We make our way back to the shade and explore a couple of more rooms before we get brutally slain again. And again. Then we explore some more. We slowly conquer the area and eventually we'll run into the map maker who sells us a map of the area. So let's quickly chat about Hollow Knight's map system. In Hollow Knight, we do not have a map of areas once we reach them for the first time. Instead, the map has to be bought. The vendor that sells the map, however, is hidden somewhere in the area. This means that we have to explore the area blind at first, scouting for the map vendor. But once we found the vendor, the map still doesn't show us all the areas. It only shows us rooms that we have explored in the past and it only updates whenever we visit a checkpoint. So whenever we enter a new area, we are completely blind the first time, even if we bought a map of the area before. The map only becomes useful once we rest. That's a really unusual system that, at least in my humble onion, fits the game perfectly. Hollow Knight is all about slowly conquering the kingdom, step by step, and being blind the first time we enter a new area and slowly filling out the map of the places whenever we rest perfectly accompanies this gameplay. It's great. After buying the map, exploring the forgotten crossroads becomes a lot easier. Soon we run into the false knight, the first boss fight in the game, that guards our first ability, the vengeful spirit. And would you believe it, we already have access to green path, the second area of the game. Sadly, we can't accompany our little knight there just yet. Sorry little buddy, but you are on your own for a moment, because before we catch up with you, we first quickly have to chat about something else, something entirely different. In 1989's Duck Tales for the Nintendo Entertainment System, players take control over Scrooge McDuck on a journey around the world and even through space on a quest to further increase the riches. So for anyone not familiar with 1989's Duck Tales, it might surprise you to hear that it's a pretty important and influential game. For starters, it was developed by the core team behind the original Mega Man and ended up being Capcom's best-selling game on the NES. The game is often praised for its tight movement. For example, Scrooge McDuck attacks by pogoing off of his walking stick after hitting enemies on the head with it, which also doubles as a fun movement option. Pretty much any best NES games of all times list features DuckTales on a prominent spot. The original Paper Mario doesn't feature a skill tree. Instead of picking new skills and gameplay modifiers in menus, we instead customize our favorite paper plumber by adding badges to him. Some of those badges might improve our guard, some might improve the damage of fire attacks, some might cause a cosmetic change and some might even make the game harder. Here's the twist. Those badges that fulfill the same function that skills in a skill tree usually fulfill aren't earned by leveling up. Instead, those badges are hidden throughout the world and we have to discover them one by one while playing. Instead of a traditional skill tree, Paper Mario hit all its different skills around the world as exploration rewards. That's a really clever system to make sure the devs can hide a meaningful reward behind everything. In The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, Link's health increases by finding hard pieces that are hidden throughout the world. Whenever Link grabs four hard pieces, his maximum hearts 
cards increased by one. That's a really clever system that works similar to Paper Mario's badges. It's a system that ties player progression to exploration. A great way to ensure that players tackle optional challenges is to tie them. When a player dies in the original Dark Souls, the player drops all their currency and they are sent back to the last bonfire they visited. The only way to regain this currency is to reach the point where they died again without dying in between. That's a really clever system. In Super Metroid, the player progresses by gaining new abilities that are hidden all over the map. Players will often encounter obstacles they can't pass yet before they find the necessary in the original Castlevania, players control Simon Belmont on his quest to destroy Count Dracula in his castle. The game takes place in several atmospheric stages that all feature. Alright, so how's the little knight been doing down there while we were taking a glitched journey through random points of video game history? They defeated the Grub Mother, rescued a bug called Sly, reached Green Path, fought against dangerous mossy enemies, challenged overgrown knights and even fought against Hornet for the first time. What a confident little knight they are. So, why did we discuss all those different games again? Well, here's the thing. Hollow Knight is a very simple game. And I don't mean that as a criticism. I actually mean it as a compliment. There are very few redundant systems in Hollow Knight. It's all very tightly designed. But not only does Hollow Knight only use very few systems, it also mostly borrows its systems from games that came before it. The mask shards that we can find all over the world, which are used to increase the knight's maximum health, are Zelda's heart piece system. The benches are Dark Souls bonfires. The charms that are hidden all over Hollow Nest are very similar to Paper Mario's badges. Hollow Knight's down slash and pogo mechanic is very similar to Scrooge McDuck's pogo attack in DuckTales. The game's core gameplay is obviously very similar to Metroid and Castlevania and so on. Hollow Knight not only draws a lot of inspiration from games that came before it, it actually directly borrows systems that worked in those games in the past. And at least in my humble opinion, it's really clever that Hollow Knight does this. You know, the charms and the hard pieces worked fantastic as exploration rewards in Paper Mario and Zelda. Why not use those systems for Hollow Knight if the game is also focused on exploration? The downstrike made combat and platforming a lot of fun in DuckTales. Why not use it in Hollow Knight as well if the game is all about platforming and combat in a 2D space? Bonfires in the Souls games are a perfect checkpoint system for a game that has a slowly conquer its world. It's a natural fit for a game like Hollow Knight and so on. Instead of trying to reinvent the wheel, they just took whatever worked in the past and suited the game, which you know is smart, but they did this both ways. They not only understood which systems of other games would be a great fit for Hollow Knight, they also understood when they had to come up with a solution themselves. Take the healing system. Healing is a critical part of every game. Healing is the way players recover from mistakes. The way healing is designed can totally change how we interact with a game. If the only way to heal for a player is to return to a checkpoint, for example, then we're incentivized to track back to a checkpoint every time we are low on health. If the game features a slow healing bar that slowly refills, then we are incentivized to wait and do nothing after making a mistake. If a game doesn't feature healing at all, then every mistake feels incredibly punishing and if a game features, say, a healing system that is tied to a cooking system, that is tied to a gathering system that makes it possible to pause the game at any time to heal as long as we collected and cooked up enough apples before, well, then we're playing Tears of the Kingdom. Simple decisions like how to heal can lead to huge changes on how we interact with the game. Healing matters, and Hollow Knight completely nails its healing and health system. In Hollow Knight, healing is done by focusing soul for a couple of seconds. Soul is a resource generated by striking enemies. Each time we focus soul, we regain a single mask. Each mask represents a single mistake. But soul cannot only be used to heal, but also acts as mana of some sort that allows us to cast offensive spells. That's it. It's an incredibly simple system, and in my humble opinion, it might be one of the best healing systems ever created. It does so many things at once, yet it is so incredibly simple. It's amazing. First, it ties healing to participating in combat. When we are low on health in a game, we usually want to avoid combat for, you know, obvious reasons. Hollow Knight's healing system flips this on its head and makes us actively want to fight enemies when we are low on health, because this is how we heal. At the same time, the healing system at 
adds a completely new layer of complexity to combat, especially boss fights. A huge part of mastering a boss fight is to actually figure out when it is possible to heal. There are tons of healing windows in the game that might not be obvious at first, but that, once learned, can completely turn the tide against the difficult boss. Finally, the healing system even rewards combat mastery. If we truly mastered an encounter, say, the difficult boss from before, then we don't need our soul to heal anymore. Instead, soul suddenly turns into an offensive resource that allows us to cast spells and to defeat the bosses even quicker. Our defensive resource is also our offensive resource. We always have to make an interesting choice on how to spend our precious soul. I unironically believe Hollow Knight's healing system might be the best healing system in any game I've ever played. It's the backbone of its combat system and achieves so many things so flawlessly. It's truly amazing. Hooray! So let's continue our journey through the ruins of Hollow Nest. While exploring Green Path, we ran into Hornet. Hornet is a really interesting character, and she's the second boss fight on the critical path through the game. After defeating her, we unlocked the second big new upgrade, the dash ability. This upgrade gives us access to a new area, the Fungal Wastes. And the Fungal Wastes are the area where Hollow Knight almost lost me my first time through. I almost quit the game here. Hollow Knight's scale completely escalates after getting the Mantis Claws. The next upgrade will pick up. Once we get the Mantis Claw, the scope of Hollow Knight just explodes. We are no longer just conquering a zone, screen by screen, we are suddenly conquering the entire kingdom, almost all of it, zone by zone. Tons of paths open up at once, and all the paths are equally necessary. It's amazing, no matter which direction we explore, there will be meaningful content and even more content behind that, and even more secrets and whatnot behind that for us to find. Hollow Knight starts out as a good game, but it transforms into a phenomenal one once we get the Mantis Claw. Here's the thing, I believe Hollow Knight wastes unnecessarily much time in the run up to the Mantis Claws. The game stays longer in the just good phase and doesn't move into the phenomenal phase fast enough. I believe there are two completely unrelated things that unnecessarily harm the game's pacing, namely Geo, the game's currency, and those mushrooms of Doom. So let's talk about those mushrooms first. To understand why those mushrooms are so dangerous, we have to have a quick chat about something that happened to me during my first playthrough, because those violet mushrooms almost ended my first playthrough of Hollow Knight for good. To reach the Mantis Claw, we have to make it through the Fungal Wastes first. To make it through the Fungal Wastes, we have to bounce off one of those violet mushrooms. So what's the problem with those unsuspicious mushrooms? One might ask. Well, here's the thing. Those mushrooms are pretty much trampolines that bounce us high into the air if we pogo off of them. The only problem? Well, I had no idea that the downwards pogo slash exists at this point during my first playthrough. The game never taught me about it, and I never tried bouncing off of anything in my first couple of hours. So my first time through the game, I saw those mushrooms, toyed around with them for a second or two, figured I probably needed an upgrade to use them, and continued into another direction. This direction seemed to be the path forward, since there were new enemy encounters and scripted sequences and whatnot along this path, until I ran into another bunch of mushrooms, which again, I thought were for later. So I jumped off of the mushroom and dashed out of the room. And now I was stuck in the early part of Hollow Knight with no idea on how to proceed. I kept exploring and exploring, trying to figure out where to go. I had the exact opposite experience of what Hollow Knight is actually going for. Instead of finding meaningful content behind every door, instead of exploring a kingdom that grows and grows in size, and instead of finding a correct path wherever I looked, I ran into blocked paths everywhere. I returned to the forgotten crossroads, but there was no clear path forward that I missed. I returned to green path, but again I ran from dead end to that end. Missing that it is possible to bounce off of those mushrooms completely changed my experience with the game. And you know, it's such a weird problem, because it is so easy to fix. There are two obvious solutions to the problem. Either have an NPC character pogo off of them right in front of our eyes, you know, just have Quirrell pogo off of one of those when we enter the area. Ah! 
Alakma. And then have him call us up to him. Or if that requires too many resources, just do the thing that Zelda likes to do and trap us with the new gameplay element and only allow us to escape once we understood what to do with it. If this ledge were placed just a tiny bit higher, then it would have been impossible to dash out of the pit without figuring out the downward strike first, which would ensure that we figure this out here. The beginning of Hollow Knight is a bit slow. The mushroom mishap that happened to me during my first time through the game amplified this problem. That one is partly on me. But that's not the only problem that can potentially slow down the beginning of the game unnecessarily. There is another unrelated problem that slows down every player. In order to understand the other problem that slows down Hollow Knight's opening hours, we have to have a chat about currencies. In Supraland, players play as a red toy figurine plumber on a righteous quest to figure out why the evil blue toy figurines have been tampering with the Red City's water supply. The game is a crazy genre mix that has us solve puzzles, explore an open world, platform through tough challenges and Metroid. It's completely insane. It's great. But that's actually not why we're talking about it. We're talking about it because at the beginning of Supraland, something interesting happens. After a short tutorial in the sewers, we enter the village for the very first time and immediately run into the shop. One of the very first things we encounter in Supraland is this shop. And this shop sells unusual things. It sells character upgrades, namely a bigger coin purse to store coins in, a weapon damage upgrade, even more weapon damage, and a multiplicator to our movement speed. Buying this upgrade makes our character run at double the speed permanently. The very first objective in Supraland is to actually buy our normal movement speed. The first thing we do is search for coins so that we can afford running. So here's the multi-million coin question. Why would a developer hide a necessary gameplay feature behind the currency grind at the very beginning of the game? Well, here's the thing with video game currencies. The value of a currency in a game has to be established. When we boot up a game the first time, we have no idea if coins in this game are valuable, like they are in Supraland, or, you know, if they're kind of fun to collect but completely optional, like say in 3D World. If devs want us to care about their currencies, if they want to hand the currency out as a valuable reward after say defeating an enemy, if they want to guide us by showing us currencies at places in the distance, if they want to be able to hand out currency as a meaningful reward for exploration, well then they have to find a way to make this currency actually valuable to us. And the obvious way to make a currency feel valuable is by having this currency buy things we really want, which brings us back to to Supraland. The reason why Supraland sells us our actual movement speed at the beginning of the game is because the game wants to make it absolutely and abundantly clear that the currency in this game is incredibly valuable. So valuable as a matter of fact that it buys core gameplay systems. Hiding core systems behind a currency is a surefire way to establish this currency as incredibly valuable. Which neatly brings us back to Hollow Nest because Hollow Knight pulls the exact same trick. Earlier, we chatted about how we first have to buy the map for each area individually to orientate ourselves and how the map only gets filled out whenever we rest at a bench. Well, as it turns out, I lied to you. See, Hollow Knight's map doesn't do any of those things the first time we buy it. It only starts to fill in the rooms we visited after we bought another item, the map and quill in a shop back at Dirtmouth. But that's still not all, because the map also only shows us our position if we have the Wayward Charm equipped. Where do we get this charm, one might ask? <sighs> Bapanada. At the same shop. Bapanada, indeed. Additionally, we have to buy pin markers if we want the map to automatically mark the spots of benches, fast travel stations and many other things. All things that we obviously want. I believe Team Cherry cleverly decided to sell several essential gameplay features that are arguably necessary to beat the game on a first blind playthrough because this immediately establishes Geo as an incredibly valuable resource. The same way we want to run at normal speed in Supraland, we also want to have a working map in Hollow Knight and fast we immediately want Geo. It's a fun little trick that establishes the currency as immediately valuable. And it works. Great job with the Geo Team Cherry. Hooray! <laughs> Is what I would say if it were the truth. But sadly, things aren't as simple as they might appear at first glance. I actually believe they overdid it here. I believe on their quest to make Chiyo feel as valuable as possible, they actually caused more harm than good. Because while the trick of hiding necessary gameplay elements behind the Chiyo paywall might work exceptionally great to make Chiyo feel valuable, it comes with a drawback. 
it hurts the game's pacing during its first couple of hours. Buying the map and quill, the compass and a bunch of pins is the very first objective that most people will tackle on the first playthrough. To do this we first have to get down to the map maker and buy the map there. This opens up the shop above, so we now have to backtrack back up, collecting as much geo as possible on the way to buy the quill at the top. However, at this point it is highly unlikely that we have enough geo to pay for the wayward compass charm and most of the important map markers, so we have to go back down farming geo until we have enough to buy all of this. But whenever we die, we drop all of our geo, and the only way to recover it is to make it back to our ghost and to kill it. Hollow Knight is no easy game, especially during its opening hours while we're still getting used to the game's controls and combat. If we happen to lose all of our geo before getting all the map tools, then this may mean that we suddenly have to grind geo for, say, half an hour just to unlock necessary gameplay features at the very beginning of the game, which, you know, is a potential pacing problem. Hollow Knight is a game that becomes really exceptional once the developers let go of the leash and allow us to explore the gigantic map of Hollow Nest all on our own. The moment we pick up the Mantis Claw is when Hollow Knight becomes so incredible, at least in my opinion. The faster we get to this moment, the better. I honestly believe that the game's early pacing could be significantly improved by removing all geo requirements to unlock the map. If the map and quill were just a basic item that we had by default, and if the map maker were to, you know, just give us the wayward compass charm after talking to him for the first time. This alone would probably significantly speed up the first hours of Hollow Knight, even if this means that Geo might feel a bit less valuable during the early game. There are so many great other Geo things in the game, I doubt it would matter that much. Finally, and that one is personal, those mushrooms need some sort of explanation on how to use them. Hooray! So let's return to the little knight and their journey through Hollow Nest. This playthrough, our proud knight manages to bounce off of those mushrooms with ease and heads towards the Mantis village. The Mantis are a proud race of fearsome warriors and reaching the center of the village is no easy task. The Mantis warriors probably give a lot of new players a headache their first time through. Heck, they still give me a headache and I'm on my fourth playthrough. Hidden in the center of their village, we finally find the Mantis Claw, which allows us to wall jump. Hidden all over Hollow Nest, we earlier saw signs pointing towards the city. With the wall jump, we are now able to finally reach it. Once we enter the city, a couple of really interesting things happen. First, the door closes right behind us the second we enter. We are trapped in the city. Second, wonderful music starts to play. And third, the environment shifts noticeably for the first time. So far, we explored a cave system, another cave that is overgrown with fungi and a calm garden. But suddenly we find ourselves in the middle of a gigantic gothic city in which it rains all day. The City of Tears. So, the City of Tears is huge and opens up in several stages. But there is one specific place in the city that I want to chat about. Because in the posh quarter of the city, there is the Pleasure House. And in the elevator, in the Pleasure House, there is a hidden wall that leads to a secret room. There, we find two corpses. If we dream nail them, then we learn that whatever they were eating tasted wrong and that they were hungry. And besides this room, there is a kitchen filled to the brim with rotting bug meat. This kitchen holds a dark secret. But in order to understand this dark secret, we first have to understand Hollow Knight's world. Long before the events of Hollow Knight, even before the Kingdom of Hollow Nest was built, several different species of bugs lived in the kingdom to come. The Mosskin, who we already encountered in Green Path. The Mantis, who live in the village we just raided. The Spiders, with which we'll have lots of fun soon. And the Moth Tribe. The Moths worship the High Being called the Radiance, who shines in a bright light and has powers over the Dream Realm. But then, something happened. A creature called a worm unexpectedly arrived in Hollow Nest. Worms are gigantic, mysterious ancient beings. Their origins are unknown to us. This worm died, leaving behind its shell. But while dying, a new being emerged. A being called the Pale King. Most of the bugs in Hollow Nest began to worship this new being, who expanded the bugs' minds and made them intelligent. And soon, the Kingdom of Hollow Nest was founded. 
ruled by the Pale King. So those were the golden days of the kingdom. The city of Dirtmouth was a busy trading spot on top of the kingdom. The stagway stations were built to make traveling through the kingdom easier. They built the city of tears and the sewers below the city to keep it from flooding. The tramway was built by the king. Some of the Moskins' territory got annexed. The Mantis found an agreement with the king and remained independent, but in turn had to fight off the spiders of Deep Nest and the bugs of Hollow Nest erected statues worshipping their king. But it was not only the bugs of Hollow Nest that worshipped the Pale King. The mushroom clan of the fungal wastes followed the king willingly. And the moths? Well, the moths started to worship the Pale King as well. They turned their back to their former god, the Radiance. The Radiance became almost forgotten. Almost. But a small part of the moth tribe continued to worship her in secret. When the Radiance tried to regain influence over the bugs that used to worship her by visiting them in their dreams, those bugs tried to resist the Radiance. And this is the exact moment that disaster struck the kingdom. By trying to resist the Radiance, a bug got infected with a terrible disease. A disease that slowly deteriorates the mind, slowly enslaving the poor infected bug, until it becomes a mindless vessel that the Radiance is able to control at her will. Most bugs of Hollow Nest became infected. Despite many efforts, the infection kept spreading. The bugs of the Soul Sanctum tried to stop the infection by harvesting the power of other bugs' souls, only to get infected eventually nonetheless. Some bugs took in the infection willingly, making things even worse. The king conducted experiments in a desperate attempt to contain the infection, but the infection kept spreading. Eventually, the City of Tears was forced to lock down all gates in and out of the city in a final, desperate attempt of preventing the infection from reaching the city. This left the city in a miserable state. And this is the reason the kitchen in the pleasure house is filled with rotting bug meat. At least in my understanding of the lore, those bugs were part of Hollow Nest's former high society. But when the city eventually fell, when the gates got closed and more and more citizens fell to the infection, they had trouble getting normal food, which forced them into cannibalism in order to prolong their lives just a little longer. And I know what at least one of you wonderful ladies and gentlemen is wondering. That's all cool and stuff and fluff sieve, but why is this kitchen so special? Well, thank you so much for bringing it up, observant, lovely viewer. Because that's the thing, it actually is not. It's just a random secret room whose existence makes a lot of sense from a lore perspective. It's not this room specifically that is so special. It is the fact that pretty much every room in the entire kingdom is like this. Everything in Hollow Knight's world makes sense lore-wise. It is permanently raining in the City of Tears, but this isn't by coincidence. It is because above the city there is the Blue Lake that slowly leaks into the city causing the rain. This rain runs down into a sewer system below the city. Later it gets released into the fungal wastes. The tramway stations below the sewers are logically connected. The Mantis Lords actually live between the spiders. If we visit the borders between the two kingdoms, we can actually find the bodies of the spiders the Mantis Lords have slain in the past. There are thousands of corpses in the Soul Sanctum. Those are there because the Soul Warriors harvested the souls of innocent bugs when trying to find a cure for the infection murdering thousands in the process. The city gate that closed once we entered does so because the city is closed and no one is allowed to enter or leave. And I know what one of you is wondering. Why were we allowed to enter it? Well, that is because we previously looted the city crest off of the fallen knight's corpse. The first boss dropped the key to the city the city crest. This boss used to be one of the five great knights of Hollow Nest, legendary warriors that fought on the king's orders. The king's crest gave this legendary warrior access to the city after it was sealed. And I know what at least one of you is currently thinking. Okay, the world makes sense so far, but at least some points aren't logical. Why would our random player knight be able to defeat one of the marvelous and legendary five knights so easily at the very beginning of the game, Eve? At which point I'd have to reply that you're actually going out of your way to try to find a contradiction prediction in the world setting and that it's not reasonable to expect the game to have an answer to such questions and that the game has an answer to this question nonetheless. The knight in the armor actually wasn't a legendary knight. It was a weak maggot who stole the knight's armor at some point before the game even started. Because the game's world is consistent to even this level. The only reason they even put the king's crest into the game is so that it makes sense that we were able to enter the city when we arrive lore-wise. The item only 
fulfills the lore function. We have to defeat the false knight anyway, since he guards the first ability. Just think about this for a second. They went out of their way to add an item that every player picks up, just so that it makes sense lore-wise that this door five hours later opens and closes for us. I really want to emphasize this, because it is one of the most impressive things about Hollow Knight. Almost everything in the game makes sense. When we encounter a random grave that says, here lies the traitor's child, then there is a reason for this grave to be here. It is the daughter of the fourth Mantis Lord, who betrayed his brothers and took in the infection willingly to grow stronger, which is also why there are only three Mantis Lords and one pillar is destroyed. If we encounter a boss that looks similar to us, but is overcome by the infection, then it makes sense that this boss exists here. It is another vessel that escaped and became infected when the infection slowly spread towards the abyss. If we find a key on a random dead bug overcome by void in a corner of the world map, far away from where the lock to the key is, then there is a story as to why this bug is here. Spend too much time with the collector, a void creature that slowly infected it with void and forced it to flee when it was already too late. If you run into a sudden bug made construct at the very peak of Hollow Nest, then there is a reason for this construct to be here. It's... um... Actually, I have no idea why this building is there. Someone in the comments will know. But that's kind of the point, because it isn't important that we understand the lore behind every place we visit. The important thing is that there is a lore reason for everything we encounter, which makes it worthwhile to think about it. Only if everything in the world actually makes sense, it becomes possible to wonder why those things are there. It's not important that we understand everything. The important thing is that we understand that the world makes sense, something we pick up unconsciously while playing. This is simply something that shines through. And and as soon as we realize that, every single room becomes so much more exciting to explore. The reason why it is so interesting to discover the kitchen in the pleasure house and to find out that those bugs turn to cannibalism is because we can trust the game to have an answer to the question why this happened. I believe one of the many reasons why exploring the world of Hollow Nest feels so mysterious and magical is because Team Cherry went out of their way to craft the world in a cohesive way where everything makes sense lore-wise. Hooray! Alright, so how's our little knight been doing? Well, we were chatting about cannibals. They murdered the soul tyrant, learned a new ability, Desolate Dive, which gave them access to the Crystal Peak. They explored the Crystal Peak, a huge industrial cavern that reaches up to the highest point of Hollow Nest and the place where the kingdom used to form crystals, only to unlock yet another ability there, the Crystal Heart, that allows us to dash around at super speed. They made it through the seers below the city, thought of terrible maggots that refused to die. They found the ancient basin, buried deep below the kingdom, that is overrun with even more dangerous creatures than we fought so far. They used the Crystal Heart ability to reach a place overflowing with the infection, and in the middle of this infected cesspool, they fought against another infected knight who appears to be a lost corrupted sibling of ours, the lost kin, only to unlock the monarch wings down there, the next upgrade. And now they are capable of double jumping. Wow, looks like our little knight has been actually surprisingly busy. So what's next for us? Well, next we have to chat about the combat design and all the many different boss fights in the game. And about the... Deep Nest is the most terrifying area in the entire game, and there are two major ways to reach it. The first one is to defeat the Mantis Lords at the edge of the Kingdom of the Spiders, which grants us the respect of the Mantis and in consequence access to Deep Nest. The other way is by first breaking the secret wall in the Fungal Wastes and to explore the area behind it. Once we make our way back again, this happens. Yep, the game literally breaks the floor below our feet without any warning and has us drop down a long dark shaft into an area we've never been before and we don't have a map of. And then the game pulls pretty much every evil trick in the trick box of sadistic level design on us to make this drop down one of the most terrifying and most memorable gaming experiences I've ever made. It's truly sadistic. It's great. So let's first set the mood here. First, this is the sound that permanently plays in the background. Disgusting, isn't it? Second, the game suddenly starts to spawn enemies directly below our feet without any warning. Additionally, we encounter these gigantic centipedes munching through the narrow tunnels and devouring everything that stands in their path. 
for the first time. The paths are small, claustrophobic, maze-like, and our sight is massively limited. There are spiderwebs everywhere, spiders crawl up below our feet, everything is confusing, and it is incredibly easy to get lost. That on its own is already like a top 10 best of of the most prevalent human phobias. There's claustrophobia, the fear of the dark, arachnophobia, phobia to get lost, they're all in the house. So the game drops us suddenly and without any warning into a best of compilation of human phobias, completely messing up whatever ever plans we had previously and then it doesn't allow us to escape by climbing back up. The only way back up is behind a hidden breakable wall. I doubt many people will find this before getting even more trapped because there is one final sadistic trick that Team Cherry pulls on us in this area. The area is incredibly confusing. It feels as if there are tons of other potential paths that we miss in order to take the one we take. This is however not the case. As a matter of fact, the path is just cleverly designed to feel confusing. In reality, it is pretty devilishly designed to lead us to a certain spot. This hole in the ground. We suddenly drop down another shaft. No idea where we will land once again. At the bottom of this trap is the most devilishly trap I've ever encountered in a video game. The most sadistic trap I've ever encountered in any video game isn't a mimic, it isn't a rolling boulder, it isn't a dart trap and it isn't TNT. The most devilishly trap I ever trapped into in any video game is actually a healing spa and a checkpoint. We drop into a healing spa with a bench beside it. So if you're anything like me, you probably thought, thank God, set onto the checkpoint immediately and suddenly got hit in the face by realization the weight of a pregnant whale. We're now trapped here with no way up. If we die, we respawn at this bench. We can't go back the way we came in. We're somewhere in a human phobia medley, miles away from any area we're familiar with, with no idea on how to get back up and without a map. This realization was unironically one of the most terrifying realizations I ever had in a game. Hollow Knight trains us to always look out for those benches. We usually make our way from bench to bench, each bench being a safe place that we worked hard to reach. But here it flips the concept on its head. Here the bench is a trap and now we have to find a way to get rid of it again. All of this is by design. Evil Team Cherry totally planned all of this. If we enter Deep Nest after the Mantis fight, we are also carefully funneled to this drop. And thus we are trapped in Deep Nest and making it back out is one of the most memorable gaming experiences of my life. Suddenly the area becomes much more difficult. Spiders appear, spikes are everywhere, normal bugs reanimate after we kill them and come back as terrifying zombie bugs. Even the grubs are trying to get us here. It's terrifying. It's great. The whole way Team Cherry set this up is brilliant. But we aren't done here yet, because deep in Deep Nest, there are a couple of platforms that suspiciously lead to nothing but a small ledge. So if we already have the Monarch Wings by this point, which is about a 50-50 chance I'd say, then we can hop up there and break the wall. And behind the wall, we find a normal grub. But there is another, second suspicious wall, hidden close to the grub. And since we just destroyed one of those, we are primed to look for another one. If we find this one as well, well, then we're in for a treat. That is, a treat for everyone who loves larger than life spiders, the rest is in for a pretty bad time. Behind this second secret wall, we run into another knight that looks like us. We run into a mirror image of ourselves that runs away from us. Okay, I think we have to reiterate what happened previously to really get a feeling for how special this moment feels in game. We first found a random secret wall in the fungal wastes. Behind this wall, we suddenly dropped into deep nest without any warning. Then we made our way through deep nest on a path that is designed to feel like we took one of many, many possible paths before we dropped down another shaft, rest and realize that we're trapped. Then we head into one of two directions to explore this area, find a well-hidden breakable wall that leads us to a grub and expect a reward, but we're stubborn and look for another secret wall, actually find one and then, and only then, we find our mirror image that runs away from us. This is literally what happened to me during my first playthrough of the game. I accidentally found Nosk's lair without a guide after dropping into Deep Nest. The game felt so magical to me at this moment, like bigger than reality. There are so many layers of secrets over secrets over secrets woven into each other to reach this point. Discovering our mirror image here felt so incredibly personal, as if I had stumbled into one of the game's greatest secrets by complete accident. It was honestly incredible. Very few games I've ever played were able to create a moment this strong before and after. 
I believe it's for an actually surprisingly simple reason that this moment felt so special and so personal. It felt like this because it truly was. It actually is unlikely that many players make this discovery the same way I did. A bit of it is level design trickery, but most of it is the game actually being okay if people don't find some of its secrets. The game accepts that players will miss out on secrets, and that's what makes discovering those secrets so special. Because they're real secrets, not everyone is going to experience them. Hollow Knight is full of secrets that are true secrets. The game is totally cool with players missing out, and I'm convinced that this is the best way to design secrets in a game because it is the only way to make sure that secrets feel truly secret and personal when we actually discover them. Another person might have completely missed Nosk's lair but maybe she found the entrance to the beehive or found the love key and figured out where to use it only to run into the collector early or they found one of the early ways to the resting grounds or to crystal peaks completely shifting around when they gained which abilities or they thought about going back to the tutorial area and found the wall jump secret that gives access to the Howling Cliffs early. Another thing that I naturally discovered during my first playthrough. Hollow Knight is incredibly good in creating those personal moments of discovery. And the reason the game is so good at this is because it also allows us to miss its secrets. Hooray! So what happened to our little knight who finally found another living sibling? Well, we chase our mirror image deep into a lair where tons of similar looking knights are tied up. And then, well, then the knight suddenly transforms into a huge and terrifying spider boss as a last little middle finger that Deep Nest has in store for us. It's great. What did you expect? It's still Deep Nest. Afterwards, we find an upgrade material for the sword, one of the most useful resources in the game. A bit later, we find the tram ticket, hidden in the failed tram station, which not only makes it finally possible for us to actually leave Deep Nest again, but also opens up a lot of new areas on the map. Deep Nest is basically a terrifying roller coaster that Team Cherry crafted to send us for a horrific ride. It's the best moment like this in a game. It might be the best moment like this in any game I've ever played, but it actually isn't the only time they pull a trick like this. The entire game is designed with this level of care. They pull tricks like this over and over to confuse us, put pressure on us, make us feel lost or cause us to panic, while at the same time carefully making sure we do exactly what they want us to. The level design is just top notch. Add to this all the secrets that are truly secret and the rich background lore that makes everything we encounter feel mysterious and meaningful and suddenly we have one of the best crafted worlds I've ever seen. Hollow Knight's world is truly a marvel, at least in my humble Orb Spider. Hooray! With our newly found Trampas, we can finally reach the resting grounds, the kingdom's old cemetery. There, we learn about the three dreamers for the first time. So for reasons that we aren't entirely aware of at this point, there are three bucks currently sleeping. Their dreams are what seals the black egg at the center of the Forgotten Crossroads. After this encounter, the game marks the location of the three dreamers on our map. This is the first time that the game actually gives us a clear objective. Hollow Knight commits so much to the idea of open player experience exploration that even the main objective of the game has to be discovered. After this encounter, our little knight awakens next to a moth. This moth hands us the dream nail, a magical sword that allows us to enter the mind of whom we hit with it. Cool. So what were we actually about to do before we dropped into Deep Nest? We wanted to discuss the bosses. Well then, let's do this now. Hollow Knight features an insane amount of bosses. The Hollow Knight wiki counts 47 different boss encounters. And while some of those bosses are more bosses than others, the game overall features a great variety of boss fights. But not only are the bosses plentiful in Hollow Knight, most of them are fantastic as well. So let's quickly take a look at all of the main bosses of the base game and let's discuss different aspects of the game along the way. The first boss in the game is Grub Mother, which well, she doesn't do much, does she? I generally like the fight because it gives players that struggle with the False Knight another easier boss to defeat, but other than that, there isn't much to say about her. False Knight, on the other hand, is a fight that I really like. It's a great first challenge for new players. I remember that this guy stomped me pretty badly my first time through, but it is also a fight that becomes incredibly easy once we master all of the game systems, which is exactly what a tutorial boss should do. Hornet is another incredibly well-designed early game boss fight. She's a great early Shadow Link encounter. Shadow Link meaning that it is a boss fight against something that mirrors our character. You know, her moveset is similar to ours, she looks similar, she mirrors our 
our own character. Well-executed Shadow Link fights are surprisingly rare in games, but here it works perfectly. She also has lots of unexpected healing windows, which I believe are there to teach newer players about looking out for moments to heal during boss fights. The next boss is the Soul Master. So that's a bit complicated. See, I love the fight. I think it is executed in such a beautiful way. The fight feels so incredibly overwhelming at first, yet it is possible to completely destroy the boss once we learned its pattern. The setting is so great. A showdown on top of this cathedral-like building. The fake out is great. The game truly convinced me that I beat him the first time I triggered his second phase. Yet the boss is far from done with us at this point. His second phase is once again so brutally, beautifully crafted to cause us to panic. It's great. I really love the fight. But but I also believe that this fight is one of the worst parts of the game and that isn't for the fight itself, it's because of the boss run. Boss runs usually refer to the run back to a boss after we die. It's literally the path we have to walk to reach the boss. If the run up to a boss is pretty long, then this means that it takes a while to reach the boss again every time we die. So the general consensus online seems to be that long runs back to bosses are terrible. And it might surprise you to hear that I disagree with this to a certain degree. So let's do something fun. Let's put corpse runs on a totally fair trial, in which I'll act as the defender, the prosecutor and the judge all at once. And let's find out if long boss runs are truly guilty of always being terrible. Here's the accusation. Corpse runs are terrible gameplay. They waste our time and they make learning a new boss unnecessarily tedious. You know, if we have to run back to the boss for say 90 seconds and we happen to say wipe 20 times to certain boss for whatever reason, well then we actually spend half an hour just running back to the boss each time. Time that we could also spend fighting the boss. It's tedious and unenjoyable. And I agree with all of this. Corpse runs are a waste of time. You're completely correct, imaginary person. The problem is, there is also another side to this argument that barely ever gets mentioned. The defense. Here's the thing. The fact that running back to a boss is annoying raises the stakes while fighting the boss. If we get to jump straight into the boss fight after every death again, then it means that attempting the boss itself doesn't feel valuable. It makes a boss fight feel like an arcade challenge that we slowly have to grind out. Immediately respawning in front of the boss reduces the boss to a pure gameplay challenge. It makes the boss less intimidating. It removes stakes. Don't get me wrong, there's absolutely nothing wrong with a boss fight that is just a tough gameplay challenge that we slowly have to overcome, but sometimes a game might try to achieve something different with a boss. Maybe the game wants to establish a boss as a challenge so intimidating that players feel they can't overcome it yet. The Mantis Lords fight would be a good example for something like this. Maybe the game wants to escalate the tension of the fight up to the maximum, and a long run back is an additional layer to add stakes. Maybe the game wants players to beat the boss on a meta level, you know, maybe the boss isn't meant to be grinded until we can defeat them. But there is a build or a trick or a weakness that they want us to exploit and increasing the run back to the boss is a way to discourage players from just grinding the boss. And so on. So what is our verdict to long corpse runs? Well, that boss runs are guilty of being complicated. A long run up to a boss is a tool that most of the time is incredibly annoying, but that when used carefully and sparingly can encourage certain things and can raise the stakes of a fight. It's not corpse run good or corpse run bad, it's is this specific corpse run good or is this specific corpse run bad. For the Mantis Lords, for example, I'd say it's corpse run good, which brings us back to the Soul Master, because the Soul Master fight is corpse run bad very bad, actually catastrophically bad. The run back to the Soul Master fight is one of the worst I've ever seen in any game. And this is not because the run is terribly long or anything, it is because of catastrophic enemy placement. So since I already hear you typing, yes, I know about the shortcut in the elevator. That's a fun little trick, but that doesn't solve the core problem. The core problem are those teleporting soul bug enemies those simply have a tendency to teleport right atop of where we're actually headed. To make matters worse, whenever we try to kill them, they have a tendency to teleport away. It's not that I hate those guys, I actually think they're cool, I love them in a Colosseum of Fools, but they're like the absolute worst enemy to put on a corpse run. If we just want to run past the enemies to reach the boss, they make this almost impossible, because they constantly teleport into our path, and sometimes even on top of us. But if we want to defeat them, they constantly teleport away and force us to chase them endlessly. Which which is an insane waste of time just so that we can reach the boss. Making our way past them is really frustrating because they're so unpredictable and hard to hit. But we have to make it past several of those every single time we want to fight the Soul Master. And that's the problem. If we end up wiping a lot here, which I guess many people end up doing the first time through the game, then a corpse run becomes incredibly frustrating. 
corpse runs are a tool that has to be used really carefully, since they tend to become so frustrating if done wrong. Putting annoying, randomized, teleporting enemies onto a corpse run is just, you know, a really bad idea. Next, Dung Defender is a wonderful boss that I never really fought against. The problem with him is that the fight is placed so far off of the normal route through the game, while beating him is only necessary very late in the playthrough. Because of this I always reach him very late when I play the game. But at this point my nail is usually so upgraded that I just burn through the boss without having to deal with most of his attacks. I really like his dream variant though. The Crystal Guardian isn't my favorite boss mechanically. There are normal enemies in the game that have more mechanical death. What I do like about him however, is that when we encounter him for the first time, we actually expect to activate a checkpoint. The game even statistically places signs all over the place that point towards the checkpoint, yet reaching the bench actually starts the boss fight instead of healing us. It's another one of those moments where they make us panic. It's great. Brutling Molek is barely a boss and more like a better version of a normal enemy. It's really funny how the boss tag sets expectations. If they wouldn't show the boss intro before encountering her, no one would even think about this enemy. Fluke Mar is a really boring fight mechanically, but it is really difficult to be mad at the game because of this, because stumbling into the fight by accident is so cool and it fits the area, it's in thematically in such a great way. Next up are the Mantis Lords. Monster Hunter is a series known for its brilliant combat system. In Monster Hunter we pick one out of many different weapons, which we then use to hunt down gigantic monsters. Some of the weapons are fast and agile, while others are slow but pull a punch when they finally connect. Monster Hunter is a series known for its complex combat and for having an insanely high skill ceiling. So what does Monster Hunter have to do with Hollow Knight? Well, nothing. Less than nothing, as a matter of fact, because Hollow Knight's combat system is pretty much the exact opposite to Monster Hunter's, with just one exception. Where Monster Hunter features tons of different weapons to choose from, our knight is only equipped with a single weapon, the nail. While Monster Hunter has slow and heavy weapons, and all our slashes have to actually connect with the enemy, Hollow Knight doesn't even have weapon swings. It just pretends it does. Our knight doesn't swing their sword when we attack. It's just an illusion. What actually happens is that the game immediately spawns a damage area in front of us the moment we press our attack button. It looks as if the knight were to swing their sword, but that's just an illusion. It's no swing, it's instantaneous. Finally, a lot of the complexity of Monster Hunter's combat system comes from all the different combo moves and the different consumable items that the game features. Hollow Knight on the other hand has neither. There are no consumable items in the game and there are no complicated combo moves. Also one game is in 3D space and one in 2D but you probably figured that out already. So what is the one thing both combat systems have in common you might ask? Well they both generate incredibly tense boss fights with an insanely high skill ceiling. They just do it in completely different ways. Monster Hunter does it with an incredibly sophisticated and complex combat system. And Hollow Knight does it with an incredibly simple one. A simple combat system that at least in my humble opinion is equally great as Monster Hunter's. While a lot of Monster Hunter's death comes from all the different weapons, Hollow Knight's death mainly is a result of its enemy design. Which finally brings us to the Mantis Lords. <laughs> At first, we only fight against one of the Mantis, but as soon as it is defeated, the other two join the fight, simultaneously. After attacking, the Mantis immediately teleport away, only to reappear a moment later with a new attack over and over again. The whole fight is like this, there is never a break. It's an extremely hectic fight that just keeps on going and going, and it is a fight that a lot of people struggle with the first time through the game, including myself. Here's where this gets interesting. I believe the main reason why the Mantis Lords are so challenging at first isn't because their attacks are especially difficult to dodge or especially dangerous or anything. It's because of something different. It's because there is no obvious window to attack them during the entire fight. There isn't a single moment where the Manti take a a short break from their onslaught of attacks and are open to punishment. The only way to deal damage to the boss is by learning their attack patterns and then to punish the attacks of the boss. We can only be on the offensive while being defensive. At their best, Hollow Knight's bosses are like dance with the boss, where we hit them while they attack us at the same time. And I believe the main reason why Hollow Knight is able to create so many incredible boss fights that flow so well and have us attack the boss while dodging is because the knight's sword slash is instantaneous. When a Mantis Lord dives down at us from above, then we can dodge to the right, turn around and attack in an instant, because the weapon doesn't 
and simulated swing arc. The attack happens the moment we press attack. Since attacking happens in an instant, it is possible to attack while dodging, which gives the fights in Hollow Knight this dance-like quality. It's great. The Mantis Lords are the first boss fight in the game that doesn't have an obvious attack window. If we want to defeat them, we have to punish them while we dodge their attacks. Once this clicks and we start to nail the timings, they become this incredibly satisfying dance, which is why they are one of my favorite boss fights in any game ever. Hooray! Next, The Collector is an incredible fight lore-wise, and the surprise of running into it for the first time is great. I love how the fight plays around with the theme of The Collector catching bugs, and how he's animated to be weirdly unsettling. I doubt that Team Cherry's priorities with this one were to make him as mechanically interesting as possible, and that they instead focused on making him thematically as interesting as possible, which I think they really nailed. The Watcher Knights are another great boss fight, the moment when we realize that the game expects us to actually fight against two of those guys at once, several times in a row has to be one of the best holy fuzzy moments in any game I've ever seen. They are another boss that is really difficult at first, but has an amazing flow to it once we learn their attack patterns. I love it. Nosk is a boss that is really interesting thematically, and I love the build-up and setting. The execution, however, is a bit... Eh. Next, the Lost Kin fight is one of my favorite fights in the game. Similar to how the Mantis Lords force us to dance with them and to react to their attacks in order to hit them, the Lost Kin also can only be attacked by truly understanding his attack pattern. I love the fight, but I also have a huge problem with it. Actually not with this fight, but with the rematch against the dream variation. During my latest playthrough, I challenged myself to do the dream boss early. I tried the boss with only a half upgraded nail, six masks and barely any notch upgrades. And Holy fuzzy, that turned out to be a challenge. I died more deaths to the Lost Kin rematch than to any other boss fight during this playthrough, including the Grim rematch. But the thing that gave me so much trouble wasn't the boss itself. The thing that killed me over and over again was something much more stupid. The stupid orange ghosts that periodically spawn in the arena. Those ghosts just have a tendency to spawn right in front of us, leaving us in a situation where it becomes impossible to avoid getting hit. Those ghosts add an artificial layer of difficulty onto an otherwise already challenging fight and, well, I hate them! Hollow Knight sometimes does this and those mechanics all end up being my least favorite boss fight mechanics in the game. Those mechanics don't make the boss truly more difficult, they just artificially inflate the difficulty by being unfair. The dream fight would be difficult enough without this additional layer of random ghosts tacked on top of it. I still managed to beat the dream version of the Lost Kin fight during my playthrough, but I think the fight would have been much more enjoyable without the random ghosts ruining the party. Next, Umu. I have a weird soft spot for this cute jellyfish. On paper, the fight sounds horrible, Umu has just two attacks, it is the only boss in the game that we can't damage while the boss is on the offensive, and we always have to wait for an NPC to open up a short punishment window. However, you know, the fight might be terrible, but since it is the only one in the game that is like this, I still kind of like it. I generally enjoy it if games every once in a while break up the pace and throw in something that is completely different. And you know, if viewed through this lens, then I can kind of appreciate the fight. The Hornet rematch is an almost perfectly executed Shadow Link fight. I really love the fight. Hornet's attacks come fast, they are well telegraphed, there are tons of cool windows to punish her and the whole thing is really difficult while still being completely fair. The only thing that bugs me are the randomly appearing spikes in the arena that are similar to the ghosts and sometimes, you know, just spawn in a way that makes them undodgeable. But that's a nitpick in an otherwise great fight. Hornet in general is amazing. So amazing that, you know, I mean, I know it's never going to happen, but sometimes... I think about how cool it would be if she got her own game. The Traitor Lord is a fight that I really like. His moveset is surprisingly simple. He either dashes into the air, which we can punish by standing still, or he dashes towards us, which we can either dash through or jump over to punish. And that's basically it. He has two more attacks to spice things up. But the biggest part of the fight is just correctly reacting to whichever attack he throws at us, which I find weirdly enjoyable. I did almost all boss fights with the double damage active and got home. The Traitor Lord, however, is one of the few actions actually went back afterwards to do hitless. Who's next? Nightmare King Grim is a tough little kitty. It is one of the toughest and also one of the very most rewarding to learn boss fights in any game I've ever played. He attacks so fast and so relentlessly, it's insane. Yet all of his attacks are still punishable and every hit is always avoidable, it's incredible. Grim really shows how solid Hollow Knight's core mechanics are. You know, Team Cherry is able to pump up the difficulty to this level to have a boss who attacks so fast, so relentlessly and so punishing 
and the fight is still completely fair. One of the best ways to find out how good the core mechanics of a combat system are is to see if the mechanics still hold up if we turn up the difficulty to 11. Nightmare King Grim is Hollow Knight's combat not turned to 11 but to exactly 137 and it still doesn't even show the slightest crack. Hollow Knight's combat system is simple on the surface, but its core mechanics are so well crafted that they still work flawlessly when fighting against the boss the difficulty of Nightmare King Grim. Not even the Souls games can handle this level of difficulty without revealing some small problems. It's incredible. Hooray! And that was the last boss that I wanted to discuss in detail. So back to our journey through Hollow Nest. After learning about the three mysterious dreamers and acquiring the dream nail, it is now our job to find the three dreamers and to break the seals, locking the entrance to the Black Egg Temple at the Forgotten Crossroads. Speaking about the Forgotten Crossroads, at about this point in the story, something interesting happens to it. The entire area becomes overtaken by the spreading infection, which makes exploring it much more difficult and the enemies much more dangerous. I love that this happens. It is such an unexpected surprise, it makes the entire world feel so alive and it raises the stakes in such a cool way. It's great. There's just one thing that I do not understand about it. Once infected, certain paths are blocked off for no real reason. This makes traveling through one of the most central parts of the game a lot more cumbersome for, you know, no apparent reason. I'm not a big fan. To reach Monomon, the first dreamer that we're going to awaken, we have to do a lengthy series of events. We first have to defeat the Dung Defender. Then we have to flip a switch to remove acid from an otherwise unreachable area where we finally find a new item, Isma's Tear, that allows us to swim in acid. Or we can just do this. Guarded behind Umu, we break the first seal by dream nailing the teacher. The second dreamer is sleeping in the highest tower of the City of Tears. It is only reachable by first grabbing the monarch wings from the bottom of the map and afterwards defeating the Watcher Knights. High atop the highest tower, we find Lurian and break the second seal. The third dreamer is hidden deep within Deep Nest in the spider inhabited distant village. In one of the huts in this village, we find a bench. Sitting on it entraps us, and we awaken trapped and wept in a completely different place. The Den of the Beast. Because of course we do, it's still deepness. Hidden within the den we find Hera, the final dreamer. With this all three seals are broken, and the path towards the final boss of the game is open. So. We have to set the stage a bit before we enter the Black Egg Temple. At this point in the game, we are very unlikely to have a complete understanding of the lore. You know, we pick up a bunch of things like that there is an infection that is spreading from the egg and that there are dreamers that are somehow connected to the Pale King, that the City of Tears fell to the infection and so on. We have a vague idea about what is going on. But if we didn't look up something online, it is incredibly unlikely that we have connected all the dots so far. We probably enter the Black Egg Temple with no idea what awaits us inside. Inside, there is a huge, long black corridor of nothingness. Most of the temple is just pitch black. And then we see a room. Infection is spreading out of it. We enter this room, and in it we find another knight, bound by chains. A knight that looks uncomfortably similar to our own little player knight. We break the chains, and trapping this poor being, it falls down, it screams, and then the game fades in the name of the creature. The Hollow Knight. When I first played the game, this took me completely by surprise. I always unconsciously assumed that the game's name Hollow Knight refers to our own little knight, the player character, not to the final boss. The fact that not we are the Hollow Knight but the final boss completely flipped tons of assumptions that I had about the game story in my head. It was great. We fight the Hollow Knight in a challenging sword duel. It's a back and forth. We strike, he strikes. It's a good fight with a good flow to it. Until suddenly, something unexpected happens. The Hollow Knight stops for a second. He takes his sword and then he starts to brutally hammer his sword into his own stomach over and over again. The final boss in Hollow Knight. The Hollow Knight himself tries to help us defeat him. He tries to kill himself. Hollow Knight is a game in which the final boss wants us to murder him, which leaves us with a question. What the fuzz is happening? Why is the final boss painfully stabbing himself into the stomach over and over again? Does the final boss in Hollow Knight actually want to die? What? is going on here.
When the Kingdom of Hollonest fell, there were two different powers that fought against each other. On the one side the Radiance, with her bright light, on the other side the Pale Knight. In my understanding of the lore, those two powers represent the Sun and the Moon. The Sun, in this case the Radiance, causes a bright, warm light that causes bugs to go insane if they try to resist it for too long. On the other side there's the Moon, in this case the Pale King, with its soft, calm light that causes bugs to gain consciousness if they are exposed to it. For too long. So far we discussed the story of Hollow Knight as a conflict between those two powers, but those two aren't the only ones. There is a third power that influences the events in Hollow Nest. To find out more about this mysterious power we have to travel deep below the kingdom, below the sewers and even below the ancient basin. We have to travel into the abyss, the deepest part of Hollow Nest. Down there are several mysterious things. The entire area is littered with thousands and thousands of skeletons of creatures that look uncomfortably similar to our player character. At the deepest point of the abyss we run into aggressive shades, the same shades that we leave behind on death. If we continue to explore, sooner or later we'll find a lighthouse built by the Pale King that keeps dark and terrifying creatures at bay if activated. And even deeper down we find the Shade Cloak ability in the arms of a long forgotten ancient creature. Long before the Pale King arrived in Hollow Nest, there used to be another ancient civilization down here. A civilization that worshipped the third big power in our story. The Void. If the Radiance represents sunlight and the Pale King represents moonlight, then the Void represents the absence of light, its complete nothingness, its darkness and shadows. At some point after arriving in the kingdom, the Pale King discovered the Void below the kingdom and built the lighthouse to keep it in check. When the Radiance infection became a bigger and bigger threat to the kingdom however, the Pale King turned towards the Void in the hopes to finally put an end to the infection. Our little player character, the Knight, stands in the center of this plan. But before we are finally able to truly understand what happened, we first have to find the two sides of the king's soul to gain entrance to the deepest depths of the abyss. The first part of the king's soul can be found at the end of the queen's garden after defeating the traitor lord. The white lady gives it to us. The white lady is the pale king's queen. The second part can be found on the corpse of the pale king himself. In order to find the pale king we first have to collect 1800 essence, which we mainly collect by defeating the difficult dream versions of certain bosses. This rewards us with the awakened dream nail. With this dream nail we can now enter the white palace by dream nailing this guard at the palace grounds. The white palace contains the end game platforming challenges of the game. After managing to hop and bounce away through this deadly palace we find the pale king dead on his throne. The second part of the king's soul on his body. With the king's soul completed we are finally able to reach the very bottom of Hollow Knight's map and to finally uncover the last mystery of the story. At the bottom of the abyss, deep below all the skeletons, an entrance opens up. This entrance leads to a path through piles of bone. At the very end of this path we find a broken egg that shows our own reflection. This place is the only place in the game where we see our own reflection. Seeing our own reflection allows us to do something interesting. It allows us to do something unexpected. It allows us to dream nail ourselves. It allows us to enter our own memories and to experience memories we probably have long forgotten. We awake in a darker version of the abyss. We hear the Pale King speak. No cost too great. This music starts to play and thus we make our way back out of the abyss. Bodies strike down on the floor from above. Bodies that look similar to our own little knight. There are other beings like us trying to climb out of the abyss at the same time we are. We hear the pale king. No mind to think. No will to break. Born of God and Void. And then? We finally reach the top and at the top there is the Pale King, the Pale King and another knight who looks almost identical to us. The two leave us behind. We fall back down into the thousands of corpses below and our king's soul transforms into a void soul. So what did we just witness? Well, as the infection became more and more dangerous to the kingdom, the Pale King came up with a plan on how to get rid of the Radiance once and for all. 
He planned to produce a vessel made out of pure void that is able to contain the Radiant's influence inside of it for eternity. This vessel is the Hollow Knight. The Pale King produced thousands and thousands of vessels, searching for one pure enough to be able to contain the Radiance within for eternity. And they found one. But it wasn't our player character. It was a sibling of ours. The vessel we saw in the sequence before. The other vessels were thrown back into the abyss and the place was sealed. The vessel that was chosen, however, ended up being the Hollow Knight. The creature we fight against in the Black Egg Temple is actually our brother. The Radiance got locked into the Hollow Knight's mind, the Knight chained up in the temple, and the temple was sealed by the Free Dreamers. Here's the thing, however. The Pale King's plan failed. The Hollow Knight wasn't able to keep the Radiance locked inside of him forever. It is actually heavily implied that he caught fatherly feelings towards the Pale King, which tainted his pure void and gave the Radiance a way to escape. After a while, the infection managed to spread from the Black Temple again. At this point, the Pale King decided to flee, together with his palace, into the Dream Room, where he died and where we eventually found his corpse. The reason why the Hollow Knight is stabbing himself during the boss fight is because he understands that he isn't able to contain the radiance within him and wants to help us. The fight then escalates in this amazing back and forth where the radiance takes control over the Hollow Knight for a few seconds and attacks us before the knight regains control and tries to kill himself again. It's really amazing. Hollow Knight's story is so unique. In Hollow Knight, the world is at the center of the narrative. Hollow Knight is all about discovering more and more of the mysterious kingdom of Hollow Nest, discovering all the places, learning their history, figuring out how the kingdom fell to ruins, understanding our own role at the center of it all. That's Hollow Knight's story. And at least in my humble opinion, the game has an incredible tale to tell. And it tells it in a really unique and interesting way. It's incredible. If we kill the knight in the Black Egg Temple, then we absorb the Radiance into ourselves and step into the Hollow Knight's place. We succeed the Hollow Knight. We become chained up in the Temple for Eternity, the Radiance trapped within us. This, however, is not the true ending of the game. There is another ending sequence that allows us to actually face the Radiance. But before we talk about the true ending of Hollow Knight, there is something else that we've got to discuss first. At the beginning of the video, we chatted about this video being interested in finding an answer to the question how it is possible that Hollow Knight even exists. Well, we now have established all the necessary fluff to have an actual conversation about this. At the very edge of the kingdom, we find the Colosseum of Fools. The strongest warriors of the kingdom fight there in competitions of life and death. Only the strongest survive. Eventually, we reach this place on our journey through Hollow Knight and are able to fight to become the champion of fools ourselves. The Colosseum of Fools is Hollow Knight's late game combat challenge. And to put it mildly, it's the biggest and most insane public burning of developer resources that I've ever seen in any game ever. It's utter insanity. Usually when a game includes an optional late game combat arena challenge, like the Colosseum, it is a remix of enemies and bosses that we fought previously, you know? It's a quick thing to throw into a game for the developers, since all the enemies and bosses are already designed and coded anyway. This is not what the Colosseum of Fools is. By my counting, the Colosseum of Fools introduces a whopping 10 new new enemies that are just used in its challenges and nowhere else in the game. 10 new enemy types just for an optional one-off late game challenge. Some of them are similar to enemies we encountered elsewhere, but a lot of them are complete new enemies with movesets more sophisticated than most enemies in a base game. The Colosseum introduces two and a half new boss fights. It features terrain that constantly changes. It features moments where it is building tension and crazy surprising set pieces. It turns the floor below us into shiny yet deadly spikes. It has centipedes trying to stomp us. It throws bombs at us and entraps us in a tiny cage with no floor to stand on. It's incredible. The final challenge is really difficult, but beating it is incredibly rewarding. It's so good. So here's the thing. Hollow Knight was made by a team of three people. They had less devs working on Hollow Knight than the average beaver family has members. Those three people crafted the gigantic world of Hollow Knight. 
they filled it with amazing lore. They placed tons and tons and tons of wonderful handcrafted rooms and NPCs into this world that tell its story. They crafted one of the tightest combat systems I've ever played. They crafted dozens and dozens of incredible bosses, some of them so good that beating them feels like a dance with death, a few of them so great that they are among the best bosses in gaming. They use incredibly clever level design throughout the game, level design that is perfectly handcrafted to confuse us and cause panic in us, like in Deep Nest. They filled this world with dozens and dozens of meaningful secrets, several of them revealing entirely missable boss fights or even areas. They made sure that each area is visually distinct, they filled each area with unique and memorable enemies, they crafted a game that is roughly 40 hours long, they did all of this in roughly 3 years, but after doing all of this, they still had resources left to craft a Colosseum of Fools, an area that features tons of enemies which they never use elsewhere and features new boss fights. They still had resources left to burn for an endgame combat challenge. Hollow Knight is an exceptional game for many many reasons, but the one thing that always blows my mind is that three people were able to craft all of this in only three years and a couple of months. How were they able to do this? How were three people able to achieve things that the biggest and most experienced game studios in the world barely ever managed to achieve with budgets hundreds of times higher than Hollow Knight's? So during my recent playthrough, I replayed Hollow Knight with this question in mind. And I believe I found an answer. Or actually it's several answers that all boil down to the same thing. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the moment where an old acquaintance of ours steps out of the shadows and reveals itself for an unexpected comeback. Slopes. We have to talk about slopes. Slopes make everything in game design a tiny bit more complicated and annoying. I actually mean that, that's no joke. If a game features slopes, then every single collision calculation of the player becomes this tiny bit more complex. But it is not only our player character who suddenly has to test if there is a slope ahead whenever he walks a step, each and every enemy has to as well. Suddenly debugging needs to take much more edge cases into consideration, because maybe a certain attack causes us to go out of bounds on a certain sloped surface. The same is true for every enemy attack. Slopes introduce the problem of how to draw enemies on top of them. If we, for example, just place this bug on a sloped surface, then it looks silly. We need a custom animation for when it stands on a slope. But it's not just the standing animation, it also needs a new attacking animation. Actually, it needs two, one for attacking upwards and one for attacking downwards. But it's not just the enemies. Walking particles now probably need their own version for the player running up a slope. Particles hitting a slope might need to resolve in a different way than when they hit a flat surface surface, and so on. Slopes are a very simple thing on the surface, but once they are in a game, they introduce a never-ending series of tiny new problems. All of those problems are solvable, but each one requires a tiny bit of development resources. Every single time. And this stuff adds up. Which brings us back to Hollow Knight. So how did Hollow Knight handle problematic slopes? Well, they solved the slope problem by not doing slopes. Hollow Knight doesn't feature a single walkable sloped surface. They mask this in a really clever way. Often there will be slopes on areas that the player can't reach or in the foreground. But the area where the game actually takes place on is 100% free of the bane of slopes. They just cut a corner here by literally not cutting corners. But it's not just the walkable surfaces that are as simple as possible. If we take a closer look at the game, then we can see that they cut corners everywhere. Hollow Knight's art style is incredibly simple. It is beautiful, and even if you give me a thousand years to try, I couldn't draw a single bug with as much character as the bugs in Hollow Knight, but it is nonetheless a simple art style that is quick to draw. It is also an art style that is quick to animate. Things like walking animations most of the time only contain of a couple of frames. The difference between those frames are often only black lines moving, which represent the arms and legs. Attacks often only have one anticipation frame, one frame where the attack is actually active and one recovery frame. Enemies often only contain out of a couple of dozen graphics many parts of the enemy drawing being reused in many different frames. A talented animator with lots of experience in his art style is probably able to draw all those graphics in an afternoon. But it's not just the graphics that are quick to produce, they also reuse them a lot. Take those leaves in Isma's Grove. The whole place is overgrown with beautiful vegetation. Yet if we take a closer look then we can see that the entire flora around here 
is actually built by using the exact same four leaf graphics over and over again. The same is true when there are tons of mushrooms in the background or signs or whatever really. They simply cleverly reuse background graphics to cut down on the overall workload all over the kingdom. Pretty much all wooden beams in the game are the exact same graphics with different ropes on top of it and so on. Or take Hollow Knight's lightning system. The game has beautiful lightning all over the place. There's just one problem. As far as I can tell, Hollow Knight doesn't even have a lightning engine to begin with. They just pretend they do. Hollow Knight's lightning is just a single gradient graphic with a vignette effect on its border that they put below the foreground and the night. Yep, if they want to simulate a flash of light, they just flash the gradient behind the night white for a moment, like when using the double jump. If they want to limit our vision, like in deepness, the vignette effect just becomes stronger, so strong that it actually limits our vision. They give the gradient different colors in different areas to visually differentiate them, but they never actually calculate how actual light would behave. You know, if you were to stand at this spot with a lamp, then the lamp wouldn't light the area below us in reality. The reason it does in Hollow Knight is because it's only a or the calculation of how real light behaves. They make incredibly clever use of simple particle effects. These leaf particles are used basically everywhere in Green Path. Cutting the chains of the Hollow Knight looks incredible in the moment we do it, but as a matter of fact, it's just a really simple particle emitter traveling over the chain, a simple camera shake, this little two-frame animation and another couple of chain particles to drop down. The emitter is even set up a bit sloppy. One travels slightly off of the actual chain literally unplayable. Again, don't get me wrong, the outcome looks incredible. It's just incredibly simple how they achieve the effect. Or take the enemies. Most enemies that shoot a projectile shoot the same projectile. The enemies that fight with sword and shield all behave very similarly. So similar that I believe they probably share a lot of the same code base. The enemies' attacks aren't simulated swings, but immediate damage zones, just like our own attacks. The movement system and the jumping physics are simple and don't try to do anything fancy. And Finally, Hollow Knight doesn't even try to come up with tons of complex systems for their game. They were humble enough to take simple but great systems that worked in the past and to simply implement those, like the charm system that is Paper Mario's badges, or the mask shard system that are Zelda's heart pieces. Everything in the game is incredibly simple, nothing tries to be fancy or complicated. And I believe it's the sum of all of those simple things that is what makes it possible that Hollow Knight exists. I believe the Team Cherry was always looking to solve complex problems with the most simple solutions they were able to come up with while developing Hollow Knight. Simple solutions that won't cause them any headache later down the road. Simple solutions like just cutting sloped surfaces entirely or like just faking a lightning engine instead of writing one. When Team Cherry set out to create Hollow Knight, they set out to create a world that is a joy to explore. They set out to craft hundreds of enemies, dozens of bosses, deep lore, secrets around every corner and visually distinct zones, while also featuring difficult and tight combat and platforming. With a team of three people, that's insanely ambitious and they actually stuck the landing. I believe the reason why they were able to do this is because they focused only on the things in the game that are truly important and took shortcuts with everything else. The thing that I personally find the most impressive about Hollow Knight is its razor sharp focus on what's truly important. It's not important to have sophisticated lightning engines for most games or complex level geometry. Most games aren't better if the enemy animations consist of hundreds of individual frames or if the game has a unique drawing for each single backdrop. So many modern games focus on so many things that cost so much time and energy, yet ultimately add nothing to the experience. At the end of the day, the only thing that is important for a game is if it manages to achieve what it's set out to do. Hollow Knight set out to be a game about exploring a huge, mysterious and exciting world. And at the end of the day, it is much more important for the game Hollow Knight that Team Cherry had the resources to put something insane, like the Colosseum of Fools, into the last corner of the world than it would have been to have slopes. Hooray! With this, there is only one final thing left for us to do. Fight the Hollow Knight again in the Temple of the Black Egg. If we have the Void Soul equipped, Hornet appears to help us mid-fight. She stuns the knight and gives us a chance to enter his mind by dream nailing him. Inside his mind, we literally challenge the sun for a duel.
the sun flies towards us and is revealed to be the Radiance. The fight against the Radiance is as epic as it deserves to be. She attacks in incredibly fast patterns, with attacks that are difficult to predict and hard to memorize, which makes them a perfect test of our mastery over the game's systems. As the Radiance grows weaker and weaker, Void starts to appear and tries to tear the Radiance into the depths. The Radiance tries to flee upwards while shooting laser beams at us, but she isn't able to escape. At the top, we finally finish her off. Void breaks free from inside us and we brutally slap her several times before finally tearing her down into the endless nothingness of the Void. The shades at the bottom of the abyss slowly fade away and we get one final shot of Hornet, finding the Knight's Broken Helmet where the Temple of the Black Egg used to be. Hollow Knight is an exceptional game on almost every front. The only thing that I can criticize about it is that its pacing in its first couple of hours is a bit slow, and even this is a comparably small problem. Hollow Knight is a masterpiece on almost every front. It features a combat system with an insanely high skill ceiling that is incredibly satisfying to master. It features some of the best boss fights in the history of gaming. It features some of the deepest lore I've ever dug myself into. It features a world that is not only a joy to explore, but also filled to the brim with secrets. It's among the best games ever created. But the most important lesson that Hollow Knight teaches is, in my opinion, how much there is to gain if a game stays focused on what it is trying to achieve and by cutting back everything that eats up valuable resources but doesn't help to achieve this goal. So here we have it, over an hour of Hollow Knight and I didn't write a single bug pun. We snailed it. Before we wrap this up, just one more thing, a couple of words on the state of this channel and my own plans going forward. Videos like this take an insane amount of work and that is a problem. Not for me, I enjoy producing them and probably also not for you, given that you're still sticking around, but for YouTube. See, the way YouTube is set up heavily incentivizes to upload as many videos as possible. Best several videos a week. At the end of the day, YouTube ad money is earned when people click on videos. And if a channel manages to produce several videos a week, then it is of more value for YouTube and they usually push this kind of content much more. Which, you know, it's just how YouTube works. Here's where I run into my little problem. Producing videos like this is an insane amount of work, literally hundreds of hours. So if it takes me, say, 250 hours to produce this video, then I start to run into problems of mathematical nature if I try to produce several of them per week. If I only ever upload a video every couple of weeks, however, well, then it becomes insanely difficult to make any significant amount of money with YouTube's ads. And that is before talking about all the other fun YouTube perks, like your Super Mario Maker tutorials, becoming flagged as terroristic content or all of your earnings suddenly, randomly going to Ubisoft. Content like this simply can't exist on YouTube ad money alone. Because of this, I decided to set up a Patreon. For the one person watching that never heard of Patreon before, it is a direct way to support content creators financially. So speaking to all of you wonderful viewers that are lucky enough to have disposable income and no major financial worries, if the fact that content like what we're doing around here and on the other channel exists is worth more to you than, I don't know, pulling a Coke out of a vending machine once a month or a Starbucks coffee, then you can make a real difference in making sure that these videos keep coming by supporting this channel. Also, there are some fun goodies, like access to some cut content, getting your name into the credits, and the option to ask me questions about pretty much anything in regular Patreon Q&As. You can learn more about all the goodies by clicking the link in the video's description. Hooray! The next video will be over at the gaming channel. We'll take a look at things the Mario Maker 2 community discovered over the last two years. Shout out to Psycro and every single person in his lovely Discord server for giving me a crash course. And afterwards, we'll start with the Zelda series around here. As a matter of fact, we'll discuss Ocarina last because I want to take a look at how it influenced the Zelda games that came after it. So we'll do Majora's Mask next and afterwards a lovely little game called Outer Wilds. Discussing those two games close to each other makes a lot of sense for reasons immediately obvious for anyone who played both. And with this, it's time for us to wrap this up. Thank you so much for watching this little video. I hope you got at least some entertainment and value out of it. If you liked it, liking it back would be a gentleman's move. If you're interested in more long-form content, discussing games, subscribing might be a good idea. And if you truly loved it and want to ensure that content like this can survive on the platform, then there is the option to support the channel on Patreon as well. All right, thanks for watching. Until next time, lots of hugs.